Testing. Ah, I never passed the technology test. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Don't you always want to show up in life where you feel loved? Thank you for giving me that this morning. You make me feel loved when I come here. I appreciate that. But today's daily word is guidance, and that made me think about getting lost, which is something I have a lot of experience with. <laughs> um, physically lost and spiritually lost. So I want to talk about both of those. I have very vivid memories as a seven-year-old coming out of a grocery store. And then I'm thinking, wow, I went to a grocery store by myself when I was seven. <laughs> I'm not sure we do that today. Um, but this store sat on an angle, on a corner. And I walked out of the door, and the home where I lived was probably a couple blocks away. And I still have this vivid memory of stepping out of that door and knowing not which direction to turn to get home. Anybody have that? I still have that in hotels. <laughs> when I get out of the elevator, I will always go the wrong direction. So it's something that stayed with me. I think it's something about our internal GPS. Uh, at least that's what I've been told. And so what came with that as a child, because uh, then I've had other experiences in childhood of getting lost, what comes with that for me back then was this feeling of fear, intense fear. Until I came up with this uh, phrase, which I've used for the talk today, I'm not lost, I'm just exploring. <laughs> and that helps. That's really helped a lot. And, of course, now today GPS has helped, too. So has anyone ever had that feeling of being lost spiritually? Even after you've come into unity. I certainly have. Um, and is that the same? as being lost physically. You know, for me, that f feeling of being lost spiritually would be f not resonating, not feeling connected to my belief that I've come to believe, my faith that I came to know, uh, not having that knowing, really questioning. And that's what I've always loved about unity is it gave me permission to question. You know, there's a Peanuts cartoon that I really love. And in the Peanuts strip, Lucy is telling Charlie Brown how to live life, pontificating only as Lucy can, right? <laughs> and this cartoon was drawn and published at the same time of the very popular book by Eckhart Tolle, uh, The Power of Now. Everyone remember that one? Which made the cartoon strip even better. Lucy is equating life to a lawn chair. And she's telling Charlie, Charlie, life is like a lawn chair. You can position your chair to the far left and live life in the distant past. You can position your chair to the far right and live life off in the future. Or coming to center, you can face your chair forward, living in the now. To which Charlie replies, but some days I don't know how to open my lawn chair. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that a good, good one? <laughs> some days I just don't know how to open the lawn chair. And I believe we all have those times in our lives. And, especially when we're growing spiritually. I think I found when I started Unity, uh, actually 44 years ago, that this has been a continuous growth cycle for me. You know, I didn't go into uh, ministry until the 60s, so I'd been in Unity quite some time. I think that this is the times when we ask for guidance. So what tools do we have for that? You know, are there instructions on how to open the lawn chair or how to do life? And do we come with that spiritual roadmap? Yeah, I think we do, and I think it's within us. 
Uh, when we need guidance, it may feel as if someone has turned the lights out and gone home. But you always have a guide within you. You always have that presence, that presence of God to show you the way out and the way into the light again. And just for the moment, think about a decision or a choice you needed to make. Um, maybe someone's facing that today. It may seem overwhelming, torn between what you might really want to do and what might seem right for you to do. But a time when you really have to make a, a decision. And when you put your options on the scales of your consciousness, do they weigh out with an answer that you're really not comfortable with, maybe? So how can we always know what is right in making decisions and which direction to go? Can we find peace in making decisions, whether they're seemingly insignificant ones around everyday living or life-changing ones? Maybe that come only a few times in our lives. And there's a way. There is a way because we're in the presence of God at all times. In every situation and every place. God is with us with that understanding and insight that we need to make good choices. And what we need is to be with God. I want to thank Barb for your lovely meditation this morning. I, that gave me that feeling of being with God. And what I want is to be in harmony with God's plan for my life. This is our most heartfelt desire, whether we realize it consciously or not. Uh, I had a big decision to make recently. Since I retired, going into my third year of retirement, I found that the income I was able to produce could support my house payment. It could not support the repairs that it needed. And I had water in the basement as an issue to deal with, thinking I would probably never be able to sell that house, right? So I called in a realtor. You know, you want to take, you want to take the steps before you make a decision. What are, if we're not setting the steps, I've got a grandson who just graduated from Ames and he's trying to find a job. And I didn't realize how hard the job market was for them. I said, well, let's set, let's set in place all the things you would do if you had the job. So we went and bought clothes and shoes, <laughs> things that he would need for an office job. So that's setting, I said, let's set intentions as though you already have the job. What are things you, you would do? So in selling the house, what were things I'd do? I'd call in a realtor. And so she talked to me about the water in the basement issue. And she says, well, you can bring in people and get bids on what that would cost to repair. So we brought in three companies. We took the highest bid. We took it off of the sale price which was what the city had just assessed the house for, put it on the market, it sold in one day. Two, it even gets better, <laughs> to a man who wanted to be a landlord. So who's the tenant? <laughs> Me. <laughs> so now when something breaks, I just call and say, hey, water's leaking, come on over and fix. <laughs> It's his first, he's a contractor, it's his first uh, time to be a landlord, so I get to train him <laughs> on how to be a landlord. And he's got the best tenant in the world who's cared for this house for 15 years. <laughs> that totally felt like God in control of everything as it happened. And now if I ever make choices in life where I'm deciding I'm not living in that place, that will be easy just to live to the end of my lease. So how do we know when that guidance is coming from within or if it's just something that we want to happen? Uh, you know, identify the decision you need to make. For me, that was maybe selling the house. Be as clear and honest with yourself as you can be. Make a list of your options, alternatives. Sometimes people call that the Ben Franklin list where you put all the positives on one side, the negatives on the other side, and see which list is the longer. 
and then forget about the decision. Let it go. Let yourself relax because the answers will then come. And they don't have to come from ones you've made up. They'll come in the way they're supposed to come. You know, the presence of God is your peace and your light in the darkness in those times. It's your inner map. So I would say if you have a problem you're working on right now, be in that presence. And will your answer come to you in just one minute? Maybe, maybe not. But by clearing yourself and any thoughts or any outcomes that, you, that have come to you, I think that gives us the opportunity then to get into that place of knowing that we don't have to figure it out. It's, the answer is going to come. And the house issue is just one of many, many that have happened to me in my lifetime. And perhaps it's something that is uh, so deep that we really need to seek professional help. And I've done that myself, too. We may need to consult with people whose lives will also be affected. I didn't talk to too many people before I decided to sell that house. You know, we thought, well, I had a little bit of equity that could have went to my kids at some point. My kids were so delighted to hear that <laughs> I had got rid of the house. That it's not something they have to deal with. And sometimes when our answers seem vague, we can rely on our intuition. Your intuition and your conscience are two of your God-given gifts, and I encourage you to use them. Let that still, small voice inside your heart and your head whisper to you the answers that you seek in the silence. Simply praying for guidance and then not acting on the answers you receive will not get you where you want to go. There is light that shines from within us. And when all is said and done, you can make right choices. We all have that intelligence. We have that ability. We all have that need just because we have the mind of God and we have the heart of God. We have the peace of God. We have the love of God. We have the light of God. And we have the wisdom of God. The presence of God is with you and around you at all times. Do we really believe that? You know, most religions are content with teaching us what to think. Which is probably why there's so much discontent with religion among people who know how to think. Unity and the New Thought Movement began as a spiritual philosophy on teaching people how to think, not what to think. You know, when that philosophy was embraced, it was asked of those joining in to stand for something and against nothing. Think about that. You know, the power of language in our words is so important. Mother Teresa said, I will not stand with you against war, but I'll support your cause that is for peace. Look that small twist on words. Stand for rather than being against. The Fillmores had a common teaching, but it wasn't a common belief. Teaching principles of thought that could be applied to whatever you thought. Didn't matter what one believed, as long as they thought about it in a principled and a positive way. One would be hard pressed to find a common belief in all of New Thought centers and churches there may be some shared beliefs, but one belief that is common to all in all settings would be difficult to discern. In unity, it's not what we think that we share in common, but how we think that defines us as a denomination. So what you think is your business, it's your religion, your belief. How you think is a matter of what you've learned. So in looking for guidance, there's four principles 
uh, four principled questions that were asked by Joseph Campbell. He was a writer and a lecturer known for his work in mythology and comparative religion. And his work covers many aspects of the human experience. His philosophy is often summed up by this phrase, follow your bliss. He, the questions he asks, and we can ask these of ourselves, who am I? What do I love? How shall I live knowing I will die? And what is my gift to the family of the earth? Who am I? We can really get bogged down with, the, with that first question. But we can put ourselves right up to the mirror and spend years, maybe a lifetime, reflecting on the surface of things. In each of our roles, we're someone, someone's child, then perhaps a sibling, a student. The roles we assume as in our work, our profession, we communicate in certain relationships in different ways. Putting those aside, who then are we? You know, ordained uh, Presbyterian minister. I was actually raised Presbyterian in Davenport, Iowa. And they still uh, accept me. <laughs> I go to a lot of gatherings and I kind of end up at the Presbyterian table for some reason. <laughs> But there was a Presbyterian minister in 1962 who was given the charge to continue his service with children and families through television. And he said, and I quote, as human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is. That each of us has something no one else has or will ever have something inside that's unique. It's our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. I end quote. Anyone know who said that? Mr. Rogers. You know, the Bible talks about spiritual blindness and seeing in a new dimension. Uh, this is referenced in Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, a gatekeeper of traditional Judaism. And John 3, 1 through 3, and this is the new revised version, standard version of the Bible. It reads, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Well, those words are speaking about us. And that Christ within. You know, in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, uh, the name Nicodemus reads, a Pharisee who believes in the strict letter of the scripture. It is open to a higher truth. You know, from our more traditional Christian religions, they would interpret that scripture as Nicodemus coming in the night, meaning that he was a Pharisee, that he came in the darkness of ways of thinking and a keeper of traditional Judaism and was embarrassed to be seen with Jesus or that nighttime was teaching him. That was the teaching time, according to religious tradition, or maybe even coming in dreams. Another great teacher, by the way. In the 21st century, many of us may still be imprisoned in religious traditions of the past. We may do things because they were passed on to us from another generation. You know, Nicodemus means coming to Jesus to that spiritual I am by night. 
meaning in spiritual darkness. So our new ways of thinking, how we think, can come to us when we're leaving behind something from the past. Man must come to Christ in spirit, in heart, and soul. We can't just come with our minds in the head, the intellect. It must also be in spirit, heart and soul. And I, you know, the fifth principle of unity is walking our talk, living what we come to know. And I think we, many of us, and I did it myself, get caught up in study groups and book studies and we're staying in our heads, in our intellect, rather than taking that inner wisdom of knowing that Christ within and living it out in the world. When the Pharisee phase of mind, the intellect, becomes receptive to truth, the spiritual I am reveals the importance of man's coming into an understanding of heavenly things. An academia's phase of mind is to accept a religion because our parents believed in it, but for us, maybe it has no real understanding. Nicodemus represents the side of man's mind which observes the external forms of religion without understanding the real meaning. And this ruling tendency of our surface religion is spiritual darkness. So it is represented as coming to Jesus by night. Like Nicodemus, we need to see with new eyes we must open our eyes to spirit. We must see every problem as an opportunity. Children see with God's eyes. They see without prejudice, without preconceived notion, without judgment. They focus on what is the same, not on what is different. They notice what is good. They're ready to trust what comes their way. They're seeing with new eyes, meaning borrowing that sense of wonder and attentiveness. Let us borrow that from children and see as children regard creation. You know, one of the questions I uh, ask folks a lot is, do you meditate? And many times the answer I get is, I don't know how. I would ask, how many of you know how to watch television? <laughs> it's not any different. <laughs> We're all experts in the practice of watching television. When we turn on the TV, in effect, we turn the world off. It gives us the illusion of being. And television has become a world for people. I'm an addict. <laughs> It was introduced into my home when I was pretty young, and I have times in my life when I've on purpose lived without it because I know how addicted I am. This is from an ARP website. The years at midlife and beyond present opportunities to reinvent ourselves. The National Institute of Mental Health has explored research that suggests we experience midlife brain changes that permit new integration and bursts of creativity, much like a car shifting to all-wheel drive. The brain begins to work in a more symmetrical, integrated way. Pragmatic creativity and practical intelligence increases. Doesn't this make you feel better about getting older? <laughs> As knowledge and experience grant us new insights and perspective, you know, positive brain changes take place at the same time as psycho-intellectual changes. You look at the world differently. I can remember when I turned 50 saying, okay, I pretty much lived the first part of my life is how does this serve me? I'm going to flip that and saying, I want to live the rest of my life in how can I serve? And it was with that shift came opportunities I would never have imagined. 
So the first step in this new worldview, this midlife reevaluation, is characterized by deep introspection and a renewed search for meaning. You know, meaning beyond paychecks and mortgage payments. And the second phase is asking, if not now, when? And why not? An idea for used by some traditions, some cultures, is a vision quest. Anybody ever heard of those? It's where you spend at least 24 hours outside in the wilderness, in the woods. And you do some prepping to get there. Um, and you can only take with you a sleeping bag. You're not going to read. You're not going to. And you're doing some fasting. So I was guided to do this for myself. And I wanted to find what I thought was the right and perfect place. And I found that on a high bluff that was overlooking the Red Cedar River in rural Dunn County in the woods. I set a date. <laughs> and I really explored my purpose. So I did a lot of work leading up to that 24 hours. You know, this is practiced by Native American youth as they move from childhood into puberty. And it can last much longer than 24 hours. That's all I was willing to do. <laughs> Setting intention is important. And when I did it, it was to, to, it was to face any unknown fears. Uh, you know, I can remember from childhood just feeling fear all the time and not really knowing what that was about. So fear is unknown to me consciously. There's some fears deep down that I wanted to explore. Because I felt that was blocking me from being all I could be. But my second intention was to be with God in nature and to express gratitude. And I think the processing of that experience is ongoing. You know, throughout the night, there was up on this bluff, there actually was a swing, <laughs> a full length swing hanging in a tree, which became my bed with my sleeping bag. And I just laid there under the stars and actually the full moon, so it was pretty bright and it was so peaceful and calm. And I just laid there knowing and affirming my oneness with God. If I slept, it would have just been brief periods off and on. But I so felt that power of God's love, the safety of God's presence, the assurance that I was never alone. And I experienced that oneness that we talk about in unity, being one with the universe, with all, with everyone. And a profound knowing that I've never lost. I'm just always exploring. So I encourage you to be a spiritual seeker, to create your own vision quest, maybe. Could be at a retreat center, when you organize yourself, or I really think it's an important tool for spiritual seekers. There's a book titled Live Your Calling, and the authors describe um, a Federal Express commercial that I can remember when I found this. It parodies the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks. Remember that one? He played a Federal ex worker whose company's plane went down stranding him on an island for years. And looking like a bedraggled Hanks from the movie, the FedEx employee in the commercial walks to the door of a home holding the package that he's finally got to deliver. And when the woman comes to the door, she explains that, he explains that he survived five years on an island, protecting this package in order to deliver it to her. Now, curious, he asked her to, she asked to reveal what's in it. So he opens the package and displayed the contents. And the woman says, well, there's not really anything of great importance, just a GPS navigational device, a, a compass, a satellite telephone, a water purifier, <laughs> and assorted seeds. <laughs> so everything he needed on that island was inside. 
And that's how it is with us. Everything we need is inside of us. There's nowhere to go. What you're looking for is right here. I heard this week in the word nowhere is also the words now here. So let's take that into a time of meditation. Uh, just relax in your seats. Take a nice deep breath. You know, it's that power of breath that moves us into help us sing, helping us go from the head into the heart. So be still and know that in the presence that the Lord is in this place. Be still and know that God is talking to you in the still of the day as well as in the still of the night. Let our meditations guide us into living in the present moment. Let us look within. to our truer self. Let this be a time of slowing down, intentional simplification. If we have a situation we're no longer able to face or, ch or challenged with, know that we are challenged to change ourselves. May we accept the challenges be still and know that God's love pours out to us in the still of the day as well as the still of the night. Be still and know that all things come to you from God. Let us connect now heart to heart, soul to soul. So we take time together in the silence, in the silence. Let us now gently bring our attention back to this time and place as we return our thoughts. May we know that to put something on the map is to bring it to wide attention using all the tools.